Check this out. First of all, I'll tell you, if I have a 2.5, forget the 2. You don't need it. So this isn't exactly how I think about chord progressions, but I sort of agree with him. And as you'll see, the way he breaks down a jazz standard really is practical and makes it a lot easier to learn the song. Now, I'm sure you recognize how difficult it is when you're looking at a song and get completely lost in all the different chords and extensions and alterations, which maybe isn't really how you should think about it anyway. As you probably already know, then Joe Pass is one of my favorite jazz guitarists, and he was simply a walking library of jazz standards. He knew all the songs. And I've been told that most of the Virtuoso sessions were just the producer, Norman Grants, asking Joe Pass to play a song, and then they just recorded it with no rehearsal, which is pretty mind-blowing. That's also why I thought it was really exciting to come across this video where he describes how he thinks about chord progressions in songs. Let's first look at this 2-5 thing in isolation and then branch out to how it fits on the whole song and how it works with some other chords as well. Joe Pass explains it like this. Why are you playing the two? What is it like? If you play the five, that got the two. Here's the scale for the five. It's a G7th. Here's a scale for the two. It's the same scale, different notes. The idea of ignoring the two chord and just seeing the whole thing as a five chord is certainly not unique to Joe Pass. I would mostly associate this with how Barry Harris teaches, and it really is just a part of how bebop works, since it's also fairly easy to spot in Charlie Parker solos. Here's an example from Blues for Alice, where he is clearly playing the C sharp on beat one and then following that up with an A7 arpeggio. So he's not thinking E minor A7, he's really just thinking A7. So that's all just A7, that's not a 2-5. There are, of course, advantages and disadvantages to this approach. The obvious advantage is that there are simply just less chord. For example, if you take a look at Confirmation, which is definitely a bebop piece, then suddenly you have a lot fewer chords if you take out the two chords, because you go from this to this. Another advantage with reducing two fives is that the strongest movement in a two five one is that resolution from five to one. And that's still there, so you keep the essence of what's going on, which means that the reduced progression will often still make sense as a chord progression. If you played a five, that got to two. The way Joe Pass explains this is by pointing out that the notes that you have in the scales for the two chords are the same. Another explanation that I really liked, that I also got from a teacher a long time ago, is to say that actually the two chord is just a suspension of the five chord that sort of got out of hand. This video is of course about how when you're playing bebop, you don't really think about the two chord. But ironically, I think bebop is probably the period in jazz where it became normal to turn five chords and actually a lot of other chords into two five progressions when you're harmonizing standards. And that probably also has to do with how bebop is very much about moving harmony. We always want to keep on moving and it's all about that flow in the chords. And if you have a two five one, then that's just more movement than just having the five chord. At the same time, they probably thought about a lot of those extra chords as embellishments and extra sounds and not really a description of the actual harmony of the song. A good example of this could be the first two bars of Have You Met Miss Jones. Where this first example has a lot of chords, there's a nice flow, everything's moving all the time, but there's also a more basic version with a lot fewer chords. Which is more of a description of what is actually happening in the song. Here you might often solo on the second progression while the comping is playing the first one. But you're of course free to do whatever you want and sometimes it's really nice to just spell out all those changes and really create a lot of movement like that. Joe Pass reduces the chord progressions to essentially just three chord types. I mean major, minor or dominant. You must look at chord changes really in the simplest form, way you can look at them. And that works really well for reducing the amount of chords in a progression and often will also make it a lot easier to understand how the harmony is actually moving, but not always. And maybe tying your understanding to specific chords 
is not really explaining how to improvise or even comp over that song. Stella by Starlight is a great example here and Joe Pass actually goes over a part of that in the video where he especially interprets the last way from E flat back to B flat in a way that I really agree with. You know, like if I play Stella by Starlight in the key of B flat, the first chord is A7, second chord is F7, third chord is B flat 7, next chord is E flat, next chord is E flat minor. B flat. I'll get to how the A flat 7 is in fact an E flat minor chord in a bit, but let's just first look at the different dominants that he's talking about. F7 is clearly the dominant in the key, which is B flat major, and you just hear sort of a straight ahead dominant sound with a 9th and a 13th in there, even if the original arrangement actually has a flat 13, if I remember correctly. This makes a ton of sense, and reducing C minor 7 to F7 also works really well. But if you look at the A7 at the beginning of the song, then that's not an A7 as you would find it in D major. There are a few things that give that away. The two chord in this case is an E half diminished and there's also a B flat in the melody over the A7. So that chord is more like an A7 in D minor with a flat 9 and a flat 13. You should probably not treat the F7 and the A7 the same if you're soloing. In general, you'll quickly come across different types of dominant chords that you want to be able to handle. In fact, the A7 or E half diminished is a reharmonization and the chord is originally a diminished chord, what I usually describe as a sharp 4 diminished. But as you may or may not know, I tend to reduce chords and chord progressions to functions rather than chords, because that also tells me how I have to solo over the chords or how I have to play the chords when I'm comping. The one thing that is clearly not included when you just throw away the two chords. Barry Harris actually has a way of explaining this type of dominant sound where he tells you to play down a C7 scale to the third of A. And essentially that scale is D harmonic minor, which is the scale that will give you an A7 with a flat 9 and a flat 13. It's a very neat way to introduce the sound in the progression and also get the right extensions in there without having to talk about harmonic minor and other sort of complicated scale things. As I mentioned, then I tend to think in functions when I'm understanding a chord progression, even to the point of where I'm actually playing the progression. And I guess the downside to thinking in functions is that you need to add another name or another level to how you think about that chord progression. And that can be difficult to learn compared to just throwing away a chord. Your pass clearly came to this in a very practical way from just learning to play a lot of songs where I kind of learned to think about things when I was in school and had theory lessons. So just a quick side note on this video, I actually get quite a lot of requests to talk about other people's teaching and usually I say no to making a video which would be explaining a video where Rick Beato or Chris Parks or somebody else is explaining something, simply because it seems a bit weird to explain other people's teaching. The other thing that really resonated with me and actually is the reason that I decided to make this video is how Joe Pass described the harmony of this section. Third chord is B flat seven. Next chord is E flat. Next chord is E flat minor. B flat. So he clearly hears the A flat seven as a minor subdominant since that dominant is then turned into a four minor chord, rather than keeping it as a dominant, which to me also suggests that his ears probably kind of think in functions as well. Now, a lot of the most beautiful harmony in jazz standards is about minor subdominant chords in major. That small group of chords can do magical things with chord progressions, and it's very useful to realize that they kind of belong together and sort of act in the same way. And you can often mess around with changing one out for the other and then get a completely different progression, but still get a really beautiful sound. Now in this case, the song is in B flat major and the four chord is E flat and the four minor chord would then be E flat minor as Joe plays in the video. The different chords that you then have available as common minor subdominant options would be E flat minor six, E flat minor major seven, E flat minor seven, A flat seven, or the flat 6, so the G flat major 7, the Neapolitan subdominant B major 7, and then also the 2 chord as a minor subdominant, which is C half diminished. The important notes for this sound are probably that the chord will contain 
the G flat, which is of course the minor third of E flat minor, and that it also doesn't contain an A, because if it does that, then it's going to sound like a dominant chord. Learning some Cole Porter songs will really help you get acquainted with most of these. He uses them in really a lot of nice ways. As I mentioned, then my way of thinking about chords is not only about throwing away some of the chords, but is instead about understanding how the harmony moves so that you also know how to improvise over the song. If you want to see just how powerful an approach that is, then check out this video, which will give you a good start when it comes to analyzing, but also hearing the chord progression.